Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> I know that each and every chair here, um, people that are missing today, either they're not well or they're traveling or um, something has to be done this morning or whatever that's, um, that's going on with our families um, that are seated out their chairs. We're going to pray for them before we go into praise, yeah, and worship. Can we be upstanding and we can, can we be praying um, for this lovely, lovely soldier, our families that are missing this morning. Let's pray. Father, we submit our family that are not with us this morning. We submit them to your throne. Father, you are the reason why we're here. Because you, God, are our Father, our Creator, and our life. Today, as we stand before your presence, we submit each and every one of our family that are not here, that are unwell, or that um, have something going on in their lives. Father, we trust you with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. But today, we submit it to your hands because you're, you're a good, good God. You're a good, good Father. And thank you, Father, for blessing us with this beautiful church. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with all these beautiful souls that you've given to each other, even ourselves, and as a family of Christ. Today, we stand in awe. We stand in awe of your presence. We're hungry for you. We're hungry for your touch. We're hungry for your healing. We're hungry for your love. And we say we wanted to open up our arms to you, God. Thank you for bringing us here. We're coming to you in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's worship God. Amen.
I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of
open up my heart to you now. Do what only you can. Jesus, Jesus, have your way in me now. I open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now, to what only you can. Jesus, Jesus, have your way. standing here with something that's been happening to us or something that we are desperate about or you're standing here you don't know Jesus or you're standing here that you're confused today as we worship Jesus want to feel that and that's the song that we were singing that Jesus want you to empty everything everything into yourself right now because he want to feel you he want to feel your heart he want to heal you he want to have a relationship with you he want to comfort you he want to be in your world he's a counselor that he sent the holy spirit he want to counsel you he want to walk before you he want to go home with you he want to go to school with you to work with you in your car with you everywhere Every second, every minute, every hour. As we lift our hands to Him, we're going to sing this song, this this verse one more time. And I want you to open it up to Him. Because right now, He's in this place. He want to breathe in that life that you cannot get from the world. It's supernatural. It heals completely. It completes everything that you desired. Can we go one more time? I open up my heart to you, Jesus. I open up my heart to you, Jesus. I open up my heart to you now. To do what only you can, Jesus. Jesus, have your way in me now. I open up my heart to you. 
clap offering. Thank Jesus for your, for filling that void, for filling that space, for being here with us this morning. Jesus, we thank you. Father God, we thank you because you led us here today. Thank you, Father God. As we worship you, Father God, we want to say all honor, all glory, and all powers on you today. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this day because your words say that this is the day that you have made, that we're here. We're so glad in it, Father. Thank you, Father, for your touch. We are so grateful, so grateful for you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray and everybody say, amen, amen, and amen. Good morning, good morning. Have a seat, grab a seat. Grab a seat. Hey, Russ, come on. Come in here, brother. Yeah, he's making, he's waiting, for <laughs> waiting for the kettle to boil. Like, you know, priorities, right? Good morning, church. Um, it's good to see some people today, some visitors. Hey, Tom. Good to see you, brother. <laughs> Some new people here. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, it's good to see Nick. I just saw Nick. Nick. Good to see you, right? God is good, huh? So if you can bring my scripture up, Joe, please. So just in case you're wondering, Anna gave me a hiding last week. See? Her back was so sore, she started punching me in the arm. No, it wasn't. Actually, um... This happened at the hospital. Um, it, it, for you that don't know, I actually do dialysis. So I went last week, and I usually go with all these nurses, and they're really good. I'm really good to them. And then I think one of the nurses put in the needle too far that the needle punched right through the vein. <laughs> and that's what it is. It's just blood that's... It's actually better now because my whole arm was actually black. That's why I wore the shirt. It kind of camouflaged what's going on here. <laughs> but... But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. Next one. When you're ready, Joe. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So we're doing tithes today, and um, just to our visitors, this is something that we do as a church. You don't really have to, but we have our direct debit details there, and we have a box at the back if you want to dump in 100 grand. It's, the box is at the back there. We're more than happy to accept that. <laughs> anyway, can you bring up my scripture again? My scripture is actually about trust. I mean, who do you trust? In the climate that we live in today, you know, even tithing and giving. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's pretty hard. But where is your trust? Do you trust God enough that you will give the last of what you have because you know that he will give to you? And the thing that happens with me is I trust God because of not what is happening for me today is where I was before. So where I was before is actually where I'm now. It's actually greater than where I was before. You know, before I, I was a really bad person. I used to be a really bad, um, there you go, see? My wife knows. <laughs> I was the worst road rager. I would actually stop traffic on the road and get out. And I should have just went and said, God bless you. But no, there's actually, it's actually some other beautiful words that came out. But that's the thing. You know, the trials that we go through, I will always remember where God brought me from. And regardless of what I'm going through today, you know, can I get disappointed when God doesn't answer? Yes, I do. But I still trust in what He was continue to do in my life. I am here for a reason. I reckon I should have been gone a long time ago. I've been in a lot of car accidents. Well, not a lot, a couple. A couple that were actually, you know, you could actually lose your life in. But God's hand was always on me. And he, his hand is still on me today. So I am thankful for what he's doing for me. And it just says in that scripture, can you bring up uh, verse 8, please, Joe? It says, it doesn't fear when heat comes. 
and its foliage remain green. So it doesn't, you know, whatever we are going through now, we can trust in God. He will bring you through. And, you know, some of the, the, the things that we go through is actually to strengthen us, to make us, to prepare us for what is ahead. So when you give today, just trust in Him. He will get, come through for you. So let us pray. Thank you, Father God, that your blessing upon us is great. Your hand is never too short to bless us. And we are thankful, Lord. Allow us to bless others and to continue to bless in this church, Father God. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So good. Talking about trust. I was um, um, didn't come to church for the last two Sundays because I really had a bad back. Sorry, I'm taking one minute. So why I'm saying this is everyone here was praying for me. I felt that healing at my house. That's why I'm walking and I'm standing today. Before I couldn't do that, couldn't even move. So God really works when family of Christ pray for you. And we thank God for this family because there's a lot of faithful people that pray. Can we clap for that? And even seeing Nick today that we saw Nick in hospital We've been praying for you and seeing you, that's a witness. And we thank God for that as well. And um, so we're going to do our communion. And um, we're going to call upon um, Jayan um, to do communion. And Jayan, I just want to say, you and Kita, it was in my heart. And uh, Jayan just got a grandchild. Can we give a clap to God for blessing Jay and Kita for a grandchild? Ooh, that's why ooh. Kita's not here. Kita's in, is it in Canada or in France? In Paris, yeah, for their daughter. And Jayan, faithful people, I thank God for you too. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Wonderful worship and, and the worship leading. I can see some newcomers. None of you have come accidentally today. By now, you'd have got a word from the worship, worship leaders. But if you yield to it, it's a blessing. You won't be in the current stage. You'll be somewhere else very soon. I guarantee. Because in the morning when I got up, I got Jeremiah. He said, I have put already in the, the word in somebody's mouth here. It could be the pastor. It could be the worship. It could be the worship leader or the prayer guru. But I don't know. The newcomers, I'll encourage you. Go through the whole procedures. At some point, you'll get a word. But you'll do it. You'll do it. Communion. I want to uh, just uh, make sure how precious it is, how valuable, what a big value there. I want everyone to feel it. In the worship uh, song we saw, we want to have your way, Lord. This is about when we come together. It's only a bread and the wine. But when we come together, it's a serious thing. We are saying, God, your way in me. In future. We are, we are already um, uh, already we are saved and uh, we are getting sanctified and he will be glorified when he comes. So we're going to work through that. God is going to help us today even at the worship leading. Uh, Anna mentioned, he's like a tutor. He's going to teach us. Get better. Don't, don't feel bad. Um, when I say something about the communion, don't get scared. According to your knowledge, if you are okay, come and partake here. God, is, God understand that. God understand that. But when you continue, God will teach you many more things. When you teach you many more things, you yield to it. And there will be more blessing. And when he comes, we will be blessed. Okay. So the body, body is broken for us. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of sin. It is precious. Costly sacrifice. Many things happen at the cross. We had to mention. We had to see that many things. It's not a simple thing. And um, it's a remission for sins. And three hours he went through hell. You've got to understand that. That's why it's big. Three hours he went through hell. So he bore his sin. Hell means, you know, the moment the, our, the whole world's sin came upon him when he was hanging on the cross... God's presence was out. God left him for the God forsaken time. You know, when God forsaken place is dangerous, it's worse than sin. 
So let us feel that. That's why it's precious, I'm saying. So, because sin, sin separate from God. That's why God came. He's helping us. He's continued to help us. That's why we are going to go through when we partake. Not only that, he defeated Satan at the cross and disarmed the power of death. Colossians 2.15. He took the key of death. Revelation 1.18. He took the key. Now he's not, the key is not with him. So we don't need to worry about anything. It will happen when he opens to us. So, but only thing is, we can't read the blood of Christ cheap because in uh, Hebrew 6, it says clearly about it. Let us not read it cheap. Let us take it serious. Okay. 1 Corinthians 11.28, it said, let a person examine himself. When I say that, don't get condemned. Please don't condemn. If you get condemned, come to me and talk to me. None of the word is uh, written on the Bible to condemn you. God didn't send his son to condemn you. And I'm not here to condemn you. So don't worry about that. The only thing is, you have to examine. Uh, I'm, I'm, and and uh, this is to this is to stop devil cheating us what, what was happened at the cross. What I'm, why I'm telling is there are a lot of inheritance God has kept for your cross. He wants to blind us. The, uh, Satan wants to blind us. We can have freedom from sin. No, See, in our walk, there are times we can fall into sin. We are not perfect. But the Romans 6.14 says, sin shall not dominion over you. It can't master over you. Because my Jesus died for you. My Jesus is with me. That's the thing we are going to do it here. He's going to save us. Uh, and let me read an encouraging word before going to the other word. Acts 17.30. Can you put, put up on the screen, please? Acts 17.30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So, suppose, say, if I call upon a small... Uh, Chris, to, I brought Chris today. If Chris is going to partake here, he only knows Jesus died for me, Jesus is for me. Let him come and take it, partake here. Because he knows only that portion. It's fine. God understands that. But when, God, when he grows up, when God, God teaches him, oh, you must be obedient to your parents. You must be doing that. You should not sin. You should not tell a lie. Then he must be yielding to that. That kind of thing. So don't have a fear to come and partake. But have a Way, say, God, God, have your way in me. Now, sometimes we think God is love. God is only love. And we can live whatever, whichever the way we can. But I found a word there, Romans 11, 22. God is both kind and severe. He is kind and severe. So I learned something from yesterday. So, uh, one of my friend's uh, daughter is living with me. She said, I want to go in the night somewhere. She wants to go see the fireworks. So I allowed her to go. Because I'm not his father. So I'm a very nice person. <laughs> so, so, so all of a sudden a call came from Canada. Why did you allow her to go? If it's your, my, my, Gita called me then after that. She said, if it's your daughter, you would have allowed him to go? Oh, that tricked me. <laughs> really. So father is always strict. God is strict. Father strict means, do you think Father doesn't love you? Love you? Father loves you. He's a loving God, but He's strict as well. Try to understand that. He's help, want to help you. He want to, to save you. Try to understand God that way. Okay. Now, I want to tell another one. Hebrew 8 2. For if you go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there are no longer remain sacrifices. Sometimes deliberately. I don't care what Jesus has done. I will do. I have my own way. I don't care whether he pleases about my that job or he doesn't displace this job. I am not worried. So then there is a problem. Okay? That's all. So it's not about, you know, possi possible to be sinlessly perfect until we have glorified body. When God comes only, we will be perfect. We have a glorified body. Until then, we will have. We are not perfect. Keep growing, like growing, but we saw, sang another thing like mountain, climbing the mountain. We'll be climbing mountain. Let's come together. Let's say, God, have your way in me, Lord. Help us, Lord, as one church and help us.
just to pray for each other, get healing, and all that sort of things, and let us be a family. In Jesus' name. Amen. God, you my God. And honestly, I seek you. My heart and my flesh, I hunger and thirst for you. In this dry and a weary land, and I've come to worship, I've come to lift up my head. Behead your glory, and I am a ruin. For there is none to compare, and I long to know you. And the depths of your love that always leads me. Time, time again, under the Lord. In you alone, I always rejoice.
you standing here, the Holy Spirit is saying, he wanna make, if you want to make it right, He can make it right. I don't know why this word was coming. If you want to make it right, He can make it right. He want, if you want it to, if you want it to completely, 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 completely get to that right place with Him, He's waiting for you. He said He is the author and the finisher. He is the God that create each and every one of us. He's the one that speak and everything come to life. He's the one that breathe and and to the to the earth that he picked up and man come to formation. He's the one that can just breathe and dead things come to life. So he said to each one of you and this is the word this morning um, as I stood there and, and worshiping this beautiful time that Jesus is dropping his his miracles. And his supernatural touch. He said, if you want to make it right, come to him. He want to make it right. He will make it right. Completely, no doubt, 100% moving forward. Just trusting, he says. Father, we thank you as we praise you and worship you. Father, we give you all the glory, all the honors, and all the praise. Father, we are so grateful as mere mortals because we know that with your power we can be alive, alive, alive in the supernatural. Thank you, Father, that we stand in awe of this time. Thank you, Father, for your touch, your whisper, your, your, your um, counsel. Thank you, Father, that you're going before us, that you're surrounding us. Thank you, Father, for this precious moment that we don't take lightly. Thank you, Father, that we grasp it with our hearts and our arms and our, 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 our mind and our soul. And we say, glory, glory, glory to you, God. Glory to you, Almighty. You are worthy, you are mighty, and you are great. Can we give him a clap offering? Clap offering. Thank you, God. You are worthy. Thank you, Father, that you are worthy. Thank you, Father, that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Thank you, Father, that you are who you are, and there is none like you. Thank you, Father, God, that you are Prince of Peace. He say that peace be with you. He says that peace will sustain you. Peace will give you that compass to Him who is amazing. Father, we are so grateful for this time. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for more word that's going to utter in front of this place soon. We are grateful for it, Father. We give you all the glory. We we'll give you all the honors. And we give you all the praise. And everybody say, Amen. Can we give Him another clap offering? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We're grateful, grateful, grateful. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in a powerful name, Lord Jesus. And everybody say, Amen and Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We pray. Amen. Take a seat. It's time for the Word of God. And can we give a light clap to this beautiful pastor of ours that bring the Word of God and listen in and bring in what God has telling him to come and speak to us this morning. And we love you, Pastor Joel. Amazing. Very beautiful. You missed, you missed a very. You said beautiful, but you missed a very. <laughs> so good to see you, everybody. Welcome. Kids are running around. <laughs> Wow. So it's good to be in church. Love being in church. I kind of miss it every week. If, you know, I don't know if you meet, I, I'm an extrovert. I love being with people, I guess, and that's part of it. But, but, um, but I do, I, I, I just love being here. And, and some, you know, it doesn't take very long and I forget. Do you ever find that? Do you ever find that you forget how, what it's like to be with the people of God, singing worship songs, praying together, having somebody kind of wrap a, their arm around your shoulder and say, you can, you'll be okay. Um, having, having somebody present you a coffee and, and, and there, was, there was a sense of love attached to the coffee. It's not just like, there's $4.50, please. There's no $4.50 involved. It's, no, I did this because I love you. And, you know, this is true, isn't it, Bianca? They're your team. They do this because we love you and we want you to enjoy a tasty morsel. But I love it, and, and there's not, there's, actually, I can't think of another place in the world like the church. 
And I talk about the church generally, but I think about our church locally, right here. And, and I forget, I forget how wonderful it is because, I, you know, you go to the shops all the time and people are transacting. You, you, go, you, do, you go to your workplaces and you're transacting and, you, I don't know, you're dealing with people whose visions and goals are quite different to yours. I mean, the visions and goals really usually are something to do with making my life better. And you're dealing with somebody else who's trying to do that. They're trying to make their life better. And you're a vehicle in order to get their life better. And of course, we treat other people the same way. So let's not say we're, you know, we're the holy ones. But in this moment, we are here together as a group of people who are saying, no, I'm not here to make my life better. I'm here to make your life better. I'm here to make your life better. I'm here to make your life better. And, and that for me, is like, I forget that. And then every Sunday we come and I'm like, yes, that's what I forgot. And now I remember and I'm so glad to be here. I'd forgotten, but now I remember. I'm so glad to be here. And it's sort of this warm moment that happens every Sunday. In in fact, it actually happens when I first walk in the door, uh, usually not the first here, but usually one of the first handful. And, you know, somebody's like, morning. And I'm like, oh, that's right. You're my church family. I remember you. I know it's been a week, but I remember you. I'm so glad to see you. I mean, Tom, I saw you walked in. I said, I remember you. I'm so glad to see you. It's been a while. (laughs) But it's so glad to see you. And I I think of that of everybody. You know, people I see every week. Anna, I missed you for a couple of weeks. And we see you. I'm so glad to see you. We're so glad you're here. Nick too. Sonia, missed you for a few weeks, but we're so glad to see you. So glad to see everybody, and I can say that about everyone. It's been seven days at the most, or six and a bit, but still. Um, so we're, we're kind of going to tie up Vision Month today. Vision Month, for February, we've been talking about what's the theme, what's the picture, what's the idea that God has for us as we enter into 2023 and as we progress through 2023. What's God saying to us as a community? And, and not only that, how are we going to partner with God in what he says in, in the community and, and in, the, in, in the year ahead within this community? And then I think, you know, it's, it's not really a how-to. It's not like this is how God is going to do things. So I'm, otherwise, I would have said, now we're going to do this program, this program, this program, because we will have achieved this goal and this goal and this goal. It's not really that for us this year. It's more a case of a cultural thing we're looking towards. And this cultural idea we're expressing as a new people, straight out of Zechariah chapter 2, I think verse 11, my memory's not as good as it once was. That's absolutely rubbish. My memory has always been rubbish. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm hopeless with numbers. Like you, you, somebody will say to me, oh, you know, and I'm like, I know there's a Bible verse for that. And I'm like, yeah, in the Bible it says, <laughs> I'm terrible with remembering those numbers for it, which is odd because I was good at maths at school. But anyway. Why am I digressing like that? Um, let's get back to where we're at. So Zechariah chapter 2, I think verse 11, and it says, I, I, Many nations will join with the Lord on that day, and they will become my people, and I will dwell with them. Is that what it says? That's, did I say oh, Zechariah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's not what I remember it saying. <laughs> The Lord will be terrifying to, oh my goodness, is God speaking to us right now? Everybody get low, you know, you don't want to be low. That couldn't have been better, that was beautiful. Um, all right, so anyway, this has been our vision verse, our vision idea for the year ahead, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 2 verse 11, um, and, and, and it's great, and we want to hang on to this as the year goes on, and, and then as we've been talking through February, God showed me something, and it's amazing because I was sitting in my office, um, and I was putting together the message for today, and, you know, I'm thinking, all right, God, I, like, now I wrote these scriptural ideas down three months ago, right, three months ago, I probably, or maybe two or three months ago, I was, I've been seeking the Lord about 2023, and so I wrote these, and I'm like, God, what do you want us to say? And then I'm opening the scriptures, and then like, bam, like God says, preach on that one. I say, okay, and then I'm doing that again another day. God says, pachung, that one, speak on that one another day, and then God's like, like, that one, 
there's a kind of a sense of the quickening of the Spirit on a word that you want to get out, right? Sometimes I can read the Bible and go, boring, like, oh, you're, nothing's going on. And that's me. That's not God, and nor is it the Word of God. Because even, even, like, if you dare to believe it, even in all of the genealogies that you find in the Bible, God is speaking. If you dare to believe it and dare to look into it, you will find God speaking even in the most, he begat him and he begat them and they begat him and he begat her and she begat, you know, that it goes on and on, right? In the book of Numbers and a few other places. But even if you, dare, if you dare to believe it and dare to look into it, you can even find God speaking to you there. But let's face it, when we open the Bible, sometimes it's not as exciting, right? We're like, oh, well, I've got that into me. That's a good thing. Move on. But sometimes God sort of brings the scripture to life. You know, maybe I've, it, it's, and it's me. It's not God's scriptures. God's word is always alive. It's me. And so finally, when, when I'm in the right place and I hear from God, I'm like, oh, yes. And so God gave me the, the, the sort of four key scriptures that he wanted me to go throughout in February some months ago. So the first one was the Zechariah one, which we spoke about. The second one was John 1. And in John 1, we, we, we reflected on the idea that, that God pulls out those who reach out for him. This God meets our hand. There's this moment where Jesus meets our hand. Like when we reach out to him, he meets us and pulls us out. It's beautiful. The language in English doesn't quite capture it, but it's, if you dive into the Greek, what you're going to find there is you're going to find some subtle nuance, which means that when we reach out to grasp Jesus, Jesus reaches out to us and pulls us out. It's this exousia, which I probably said wrong. I know you're a, yeah, I'm just looking at you because I know you're a Greek speaker and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, we'll talk about that later. But I, think, but I know, and it's like this pulling out and not just pulling out, but pulling out to give a new name to, the name of a child of God. It's a pulling out not just to rescue you from like a muddy, miry pit, but to actually to rename you and to re, I guess to, to reassess who you are and to make you into somebody new. You are no longer a child of violence or a child of pleasure seeking, get everyone else, get everyone to seek my pleasure and, and, a, and a world, and this is all in that scripture in, in John 1, um, what to say violence and pleasure and control, right? Remember those three things? I don't know if you do. If you were here, you might. And he pulls us out of that and says, no, you're no longer one of them anymore. You're a child of God. And that comes not just as a like, oh, we get to sit and hug God as our father. Because that's a good thing. But that's an infant thing. What God is saying to you is going to not only do that, but he's going to progress you through that time, which is a beautiful time. And then he's going to mature you, but as his son. He's going to grow you as his son. He's going to grow you as his son. And in a way, that's kind of what John was talking about when he's talking about communion. As we hear from the Lord, we are strengthened and we are matured. We get to grow. Then we hear some more. We're strengthened. We get to mature and we get to grow as we partner with his leading in this maturity process. But it's a child of God is the context. It's not like student master. It's not like overlord with a big stick that sort of get back in line. It's not like that. It's father, son, father, daughter. Let's mature. Let's grow up. That's my goal for my kids. I don't want them to be on my lap anymore. Like they're 16 and 14. If I get a 16 and a 14 year old sitting on my lap, I feel a bit weird about that. <laughs> and I think they would feel a bit weird about that too. Probably have a bit of a laugh and make a joke of it. They'll probably do it this afternoon just to, you know. But, yeah, you want your kids to come up for a hug. There was, I, can I just say, I feel guilty about this. There was a moment, I'm way off track, sorry. Let's say it anyway because you want to know why I feel guilty because it's a tidbit of really fun information. Um, Annalise was at Duke of Edinburgh camp. Great. She was away three days camping out and getting in amongst the dirt, hiking, canoeing, kayaking, the whole lot, you know, making her own food. Good on you. Well, I had a great time. I went to pick her up, and she's like, come for a hug. And I'm like, no, you have not had a shower in three days. <laughs> You've been in the mud. No. <laughs> Go home, have shower, hugs ready. But I felt a little bit guilty about that. I'm like, do I, <laughs> do I want to be that kind of dad? I want to be a hugging kind of dad, right? I mean, we had a lot. I'm just saying. 
Anyway, so that's who we got. We got John 1. And then we looked at uh, last week, I think it was Peter, 1 Peter 1. And 1 Peter 1 is fallen out of my memory, but I wonder if, I can't remember. It's verse 3, anyway. But 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Oh, it's like, yes, I've given you birth into a new hope and a new future which doesn't corrode and destroy and doesn't fade away. It doesn't, the great, the great few words, um, I think it's on the next verse, actually, the three words that I love. Yeah, it's not imperishable. It's not, un, it, it's, it's completely uncorrupt. Hang on, I said that wrong. It is imperishable. It is uncorrupted and it is unfading. In any way that you look at the things in this world, that's kind of what happens to them all. Every single thing on our planet Earth, that's what happens. They either perish or they get corrupted. That means they get stained or they get dirty or they get twisted into a dip, the wrong thing. Or they fade. That means they may rust or they, or, you know, I, I, had a, I was walking down the street in a, in a pair of trousers on actually just literally Friday. And I was saying to Vanessa, I love these. It wasn't these ones, but I love these trousers, but they're starting to fade. As I looked at them, they're kind of like, they don't have the newness that they once had. I'm just, I'm not that old, but I'm just saying, you know, I just noticed things fade. Things get old. Cars get old. They wear out. We just spent $1,300 $1, making our car keep working this week. That's a lot of money, but things fade. Things break. Things rust. But we're, the inheritance that Jesus offers is imperishable. Will never fade will never rust, will never be corrupted, will never be distorted, will never be stained, will never be, a peri- it can't fade, it can't perish. It's God's eternal glory for us. And it's a beautiful thing. And so today we're going to look at Romans 8.1. And Romans 8.1 is probably one of everybody's favorite scriptures. Romans 8.1, if once you find Romans 8.1, you love it. Everyone loves. In fact, if you read Romans 8, the whole thing, most people, once they read and find Romans 8, they're like, oh, that's my favorite scripture. But then they keep reading on and they find 1 Corinthians 13, and then they think, no, no that's my favorite scripture. That's the love one, right? But then they go, but 1 Corinthians, sorry, Romans 1.8 is, is a favorite for so many people. There is, it says, there is no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. I unsaid it. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We think of the word condemnation as a really final kind of bad word. A house that is condemned only fit for destruction. A house or or, um, if a person is condemned to die. That's the way we use that word condemned. And it's accurate. But there's more to it than that. Because condemned just simply means the punishment meted out on crimes d- done. So, so what you would have is a court of law. You would have a case brought. And then you would find out that the person was guilty. And everyone would agree. The, uh, the jury all agreed. It's unanimous. This person committed the crime. They may even have confessed it. Oh, yes, I committed the crime. So we know that they're guilty. It's not about the trial. It's about what happens next. Condemnation is about what happens next. It's like, so if you commit a crime worth 25 years in prison, the judge may say that. You are condemned. I won't use that word necessarily because it sounds so final. But this is what they mean. You are condemned for a 25-year term in prison. That's what it means. Sentencing. It's that space in, in the law. And so there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is a case brought against us. There is guilt for wrong. There is, in some cases we confess it, in other cases we don't confess it. And it's worth noting both. And there is a condemnation there for the guilt that we carry. However, Jesus has picked it up and said, nope, not anymore. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We go free. We walk free. What we did, we are guilty of. The sentence is laid down, but the sentence is not carried out. We are given freely. Undeserved freedom. That's what this means. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, this is interesting because here's what I think. Some people get mixed up on this scripture. 
And you know what? I reckon people have been mixed up on this scripture right from the very first time it was written. I have a theory. This is not Bible. This is Joel, backed up by other people who've said it, but still claim it as Joel. If you don't like it, throw it in the bin. But here's an interesting thought. If you were to open up the New King James Version of the very same verse, it's going to say something different. It's the only one really these days that carries that change. There are about two or three others that do carry the extra bits. But now they've since discovered the extra bits. They were on newer documents that they get the Bible from. The older documents that are closer or more likely to be accurate to the original don't have the extra bit. And so most Bible translations now remove the extra bit. And even, in fact, New King James, which hangs onto it, it's got a little footnote. This is not in the original documents. Why is it there? Well, I think people got caught up on this scripture back then, just like they do today. That says this, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, and this is what it says up there, who walk according to the... Oh, it got knocked off. Walk according to the flesh, who walk not according to the flesh, I should say, but according to the Spirit. Now, that's not in the Bible, but Joel, the Joel theory says that that's there because somebody, sometime after Paul wrote it, was like, people keep getting caught up in this Scripture. We've got to add something in there to help people understand this Scripture, and that's why they wrote it. And I think that that same issue still carries into us today. People still get caught up in this Scripture and kind of get it a little bit wrong, and, and that's why. So, actually, he's just put verse 4 up a few verses. That's all it is. So it's not, it's, not, it's not a misquote. It's still in the Bible. If you were to go down to verse 4, you'll find those very same words, word for word. So it's not like that somebody's added to the Bible. But anyway, why do they get it mixed up? All right. We're going to go back in time a little bit. Way back to Genesis chapter 3. All right. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? If you don't know what happened in Genesis, you don't have to go there, Joe. Don't, don't be racing around. It's a story. <laughs> in Genesis chapter 3, I know, I'm just watching Joe like, <laughs> Joe didn't tell me about this. <laughs> in fact, I didn't tell you about any of these, but you're doing really well. I just want to say well done. But um, in Genesis chapter 3, we have what's known as the fall. Adam and Eve walking and talking with Jesus in the garden, full of his presence, like the cool, it's beautiful, right? Eden. Whenever you think of Eden, you've got to think of the, the perfection that God created the world to be, where where the fruit of all kinds of trees in all kinds of seasons will be edible for people. You'll never have to worry. You'll never have to even farm it. It's going to be there. Just pull it off. And then, and then, and then not only that, I'm going to supply all your needs. Don't worry about that. And, and, and not only that, it's going to be beautiful. I'm not just going to give you cardboard to eat to survive on. I'm going to give you a multitude of flavors, mangoes and rambutans and bananas and apples and raspberries and strawberries and such a mixture of different fruits and vegetables that you can eat. And I'm not advocating for vegetarianism because I love bacon. I'm just simply saying that's how it was done in the beginning, right? It was a beautiful world where everything was made for people that their needs would be met, but not only their needs would be met, but they would be, it would be beautiful. It said it would be delightful, that's a word that often you'll find in that scripture. It was a delight to eat. And then, not only that, he would walk through them in the cool of, through Eden with them, not walk through them. <laughs> that's a horrible image, isn't it? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, walk with them through Eden, and he would do that. And, and, and what would happen was, whenever they're like, hey, God, I don't know, what, what should we do here? God's like, oh, well, I can help you with that. I can give you the wisdom you need for that because he would walk with them. And whenever he, whenever people may have had a question, or oh, like, I don't know what to do, God, God would be right there, walking with them to provide wisdom and understanding as they went. But as I said, we have the fall in Genesis 3. That's how God made the world. He made it in a way where he would provide his beloved people all they needed. He would provide it not just what they needed, but what they would love. He made it in a delightful and beautiful way. And not only that, he said, I'm going to walk with you through this. I'm going to be with you always. 
There was only one thing they couldn't do, which was this tree, tree in the middle. And we're meant to, like, that was kind of like the, I suppose in a way it was kind of like the test of God, but it, it, it's sort of a sense, this tree in the middle, don't eat from that tree, God said. It's really the only rule he gave them, which is weird. But anyway, let's fast forward. Uh, Eve and the snake have a conversation. <laughs> There's a problem right there. But for some reason, she had a conversation with the snake. And But anyway, after that conversation where he said, why don't you go try it? Why don't you go try it? This is what Eve said about the tree. She said, the fruit of the tree was good for food. The fruit of that tree could supply my needs. She then said, not just good for food. She said it was uh, appealing to the eye, which is essentially saying it wasn't just needs-based good, it was beauty, it was beautiful. Just like the rest of creation, mind you, this was not the only beautiful food. And she said, and it was desirable for getting wisdom. They're the three things that she said before both Adam and Eve ate the fruit. It's good for food, it's beautiful to be told, and is desirable for gaining wisdom. All of the things that God provided in abundance for them. So what was the real problem? Obviously, the real problem is they wanted it their way. God provided it in abundance, but they wanted it in their own way, outside of the way that God called them to have it. And so we know what happened. They have their fruit and things go bad, right? Okay, so back to Romans 8, chapter 1. Romans 8, chapter 1 says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember that? Let's go back again to Adam and Eve. <laughs> We're going to bounce a little bit. But Adam and Eve, once they ate the fruit, there was condemnation on them. There was. They, they, they were guilty of doing what they shouldn't have done. And the condemnation on them, the punishment meted out, was death. You think, well, that's pretty harsh, God. For eating an apple, they're dead. It's not about that. You know it's not about that. But what happened was death was the only result. And, and I think, to be honest, if you unpack it a little bit, you might go, De death was kind of God's only sense of mercy. Because if we go back to the three things, it was good for food. So if we go start there, and we go, all right, now let's play that out to the end. If people are willing to do everything and anything to get what they need, if we allow that in, a, in an uncontrolled way, this is God maybe thinking, if we allow that in an uncontrolled way, what might happen? People might trample on each other to get what they need. People might push others into slavery to get what they need. You see what I'm saying? So if God's like, I've got to limit that. Death has to be a limit to that. I can't let that go out of control because people will get hurt. And people do get hurt, but he's trying to put a limit on it. Next, he said, to get, to get beautiful things, to get pleasurable things, God is like, all right, if people pursue pleasure in the only way that they can possibly, in their own way, however they might be able to get it, I've got to put a limit on that because that's going to lead to abuses, sexual abuses on people. It's going to lead to gluttony, with abuse on the self. It's going to lead to all kinds of, I've got to put a limit on that. Death becomes the limit. And of course, it's exactly the same if we go to our third one, about wisdom and understanding and control. If people are like, I want to get wisdom my own way, if I want to run the world my own way, doing my own ideas, that's got problems. Because if people do that without following after God's law, the worst it could be is that we get into political tensions and wars and all kinds of wrong. So you can see that God's condemnation was almost a sense of mercy in that to protect people as they walk into the world. Death is, puts a limit on it at least. They're still going to do 
those things, but at least they'll be limited on how much they can do. You know what I mean? Anyway, so Romans 1.8 says, though, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What is the condemnation on everybody? The condemnation is death. That's on everybody since the very beginning, all through history, up until now, and forever until the future. The condemnation is death, and it's a sense of that sense is meted out in a sense of mercy to care and protect other people. And that's kind of what you do in a court of law, isn't it? We put people away uh, into prison and, and meet out punishment, really, mostly. Sometimes it's about punishment. I don't like that kind of, you know, law. I like the kind of law that's there to protect others. Like, so, for instance, if we had a child abuser putting them in a prison for a long time, and maybe for all their life, is a good thing because it protects all the vulnerable people that could be hurt. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So there's a sense where condemnation is not a bad thing. But anyway, I want to get back to that idea that condemnation was there for all of us because we all went searching for our needs in our own way, willing to trample on other people to get them. We all seek after pleasure in our own way, ignoring the good, and we end up doing harm to ourselves and others in the process. And we all have a tendency towards wanting control and being the ones who decide what's right and wrong. So condemnation was on all of us. But in Jesus, there is no condemnation. In Romans 1, there is no condemnation. In fact, actually, it's really more, even more emphatic in the original regional language. It's like, not one condemnation. Like, there is not one condemnation on those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you, and this is why that extra bit of Bible was added by some of people later, but you'll find it in verse 4 anyway. If you grab a hold of that scripture, but, are, but in a way driven and motivated by, and he uses the word flesh, but that's a catch-all for meaning anybody who seeks after things that they need, want, or desire and wisdom for their own, on their own. That's what that means. So it's the same, it's a one, one word that captures the whole Genesis idea, right? If you grab that scripture from a motivation of the flesh, you're going to get it wrong. This is what you're going to do. Let's say you're motivated by needs. Let's say you're like, I, I will, you know, I, I love you, God, but I'm going to go get my needs however I want, right? Right? Let's say we took that approach. And we grab this scripture and there is no condemnation. We're like, oh, I needed that. So God says there's no condemnation on me. So it's okay that I went and got that help because I needed it. Have you ever heard that argument? Have you ever had that argument in your own head? Yeah, but God knows I need it. <laughs> God knows I need it. Short story. When I was maybe 15 years ago, I was working at a church, Lane Cove C3, great church. And what happened was I received my salary uh, on a monthly basis, but it's sort of up to me to manage how it, does not, it doesn't, didn't come, doesn't come in sort of an, a fixed amount. I, I manage it my, myself throughout the year according to my bills and so forth through the year. I hit November and I'm like, things are going great. Until I realized that I had done my salary divided by 11 and not by 12. We landed in December and went, oops. <laughs> All of our year's money had come in. Kids were little. Vanessa was at home. We had no salary other than mine. And we're like, we've got December to live through here. And then I looked at our bank account. It was right just after we'd opened our mortgage. And so we'd open this mortgage out, which meant that we were right on the edge. You know, when you first start your mortgage, that's when you're right on the edge. And then as you go on, it gets a little easier, a little easier, a little easier, right? Right. So we're right at the beginning. So every month mattered. And there we are with a month, no income. Oh, it's okay. Just check out a bank account. Bank account wasn't looking good. Maybe a thousand bucks, maybe less. How much is the mortgage repayment? More than that. And then I was like, okay, this is a moment. 
Sometimes you have these moments. I don't want you to take this as a rule, but for us, this was a moment. Do you believe that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus? Or are you going to go out and get the things you need your own way yourself, therefore taking the no condemnation in Christ Jesus in the context of the flesh, right? Sorry, it's getting a little bit convoluted, but do you understand what I mean? You with me? Good. The choice was that. Now, we had enough to get through the month if we didn't tithe. We had enough to pay the mortgage and survive to get through December until January kicked in and we could start getting more income again. We, we had enough if we didn't tithe. That was a moment. Now, I'm a 100% believer in I give 10% away of my income every month. It's the first thing that happens, actually. So I look at my income for the month, tithe straight away. I'm not telling you that you have to do that. I'm telling you that that's a scriptural standard that you can work towards as a goal. There's no reason to go over that. The scriptures never ask you for more than that unless you want to be generous in a different way, but that's different. Right? So, so I'm a firm believer in it. I'm not only I'm a believer in it in myself, but I'm a practicer of my belief. And so that's what we do. Leave that out there with you. But that was a moment for us to, that was a test moment for me. Will you tithe or not? And trust me that I will supply all your needs according to me. Well, praise God, for some reason I did trust Jesus. <laughs> I put the tithe in as I normally do, which left us not enough to live on for December. And I'm like, well, God, I want to honor you first. If we've got to go into a little bit of credit card debt, that's okay. We'll be able to pay it off in January. I'll be okay with that. That was kind of how I resolved it in my mind. But what I really was doing was saying, no, I trust you, Jesus. And then you wouldn't believe, well, you would believe it, I don't know, if you believe in people, but a check came in the mail from I don't know where, and I, don't, I still don't know where. Like, I have no idea where. None. We, didn't, we weren't owed anything from anybody. It was, it was not related to my salary. In fact, it was a bank check which had no name on it and no information on it, which totally covered us for January. And in fact, it was about double what we put in for tithe. A little bit more than double, actually. Right. <laughs> From that moment onward, God tested me. I made it through the test. And God has put that confidence in me now. I, I have no worries whatsoever about the finances in our house in terms of the things that we need. All right. But had I have done the opposite and gone, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I might have said, well, I'm just going to get what I need, however I need it. I'm just going to not tithe. I'm not going to follow through with what I've convicted that God has asked me to do. I'm going to ignore what God has asked me to do, which is the definition of sin. I'm going to ignore what God wants to ask me to do in order to get the things that I need. That's how you would read that scripture wrong. Second way you would read that scripture wrong is if you're someone who's driven by the flesh and pleasure and joy. You'd be like, there is no condemnation. You know this is going to sound wrong, and so you, you're going to agree with me. This is wrong. You're going to go, and you're going to go, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means I can do whatever I want. I can go eat till I burst. I can go have as many relationships with as many people as I decide. Even if I don't want to, I'm still going to because it's pleasurable. I can do whatever I want. Because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes. Give me some drugs. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Of course that's wrong. You all agree. Of course that's wrong. Not everyone agrees. I'm just looking at you. You all agree. <laughs> Because now in our culture, pleasure is thought of as a right. Anyway, we'll put that aside for now. That's the second way you can read that scripture wrong, in the flesh. The third way you can read that scripture wrong, in the flesh, is related to the, it's, you know, Eve said it's good for wisdom. It's 
about control, knowing, doing what's right. I believe what's right, doing what I know is right because I get to be the one who's in charge of what's right. Those people tend to focus on the in Christ bit. This is going to sound a bit funny to you. But what happens is, so, that, so, that, so the flesh people go, no condemnation, I can do whatever I want. The same with the kind of needs people, they go, well, no condemnation, I'm okay. The, 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 the people who want the control, they tend to focus on the in Christ bit. They're like, well, if you're in Christ, right, they, they put an if there. There's no if there, but they put if here. And they're like, so what have I got to do to make sure I'm in Christ? Well, let's start at the start. I can't swear anymore. And neither can you, mind you. If you swear, I know you're not in Christ. So the condemnation that's available, like that, that, the no condemnation that's available, no, well, that's, that's on you again. Because I'm in control of what's right and wrong. I'm the one that's telling you what you can and can't do. I'm telling me what I can and can't do. So I mustn't do that. I mustn't swear then. Well, I can't smoke a cigarette. I can't, uh, certainly can't, um, yeah, you've got to be holy. You can't drink anymore. You've got to be, you, you know, I'm, not, I'm certainly not advocating drunkenness, but I'm just saying you can't, you know, don't read, in, read it. Don't, don't go too far with what I'm saying here, right? Just hear what I'm saying. People, we, I, develop rules of my own to qualify Jesus' statement so that I can work up to the no condemnation bit and feel proud and pr- full of pride that I have achieved it. However, in the back of my mind, I'm going, I still get it wrong. In the back of my mind, I still feel guilty for the mistakes I make. Oh, I've got to try harder next time. Next time when I come to this meal, I'm not going to overeat. And then the meal ends up being something that Gita makes. All right, next time after. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, don't you? You're all laughing because you know what, you know, these are the great, she's not here, I can lift her up while she's not here. But you know what I'm saying, don't you? We're kind of like, yes, I mustn't, and we kept this must I've got to do, and I've got to do, and I've got to work my way to this position where God will finally agree to that scripture and say there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to work. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Now, if you open Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, that's what you're going to find. Those arguments that I've just preached right, right now. You're going to find all three of those right through Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. Where Jesus says there, are, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. How do we read it? And I'm going to finish with this. How do we read it? It says here, for those, uh, it says, what does it say? Uh, those who live in, by the Spirit and not by the flesh. If we appropriate that scripture from the desire of the flesh to be in control or to, be, to get my needs met however I want and, or just to get pleasure and, and you know, use it as a get out of free jail card, then I'm misunderstanding the scripture. I've got to take it from being in the Spirit. And what's in the Spirit? The Spirit is the presence of God with us. What does the presence of God with us look like? The presence of God with us looks a lot like Eden, where God walked, His presence walked, with people in a world that He made that was abundant, in a world that He made that was beautiful, and He would walk with us. Do you see? When Jesus... Jesus restored Eden to us as we walk in the Spirit, that we walk in the presence of God, trusting in the presence of God. So let me encourage you. This, you know, this is what I, sorry, I sort of started something and didn't finish it. At the start, I said, God gave me these scriptures way back, right? As I sat back and looked at them this week, I noticed the first week was a prophecy. Zechariah was a prophecy talking about a future day. John was talking about the day when it happened, the day that Zechariah prophesied for. Peter is talking about a future hope. And I'm like, right here, we've got prehistory. We've got history. We've got future. What have we got left now? Romans is about now. I couldn't believe it when I looked at all these things. I'm like, wow, God, I didn't plan that. You planned that. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus that, that he wanted to show us, that he talked about this in, in way back. And then it happened when Jesus came. And not only that, he's got a future hope for us. And not only that, he's helping us live in this moment today. 
walking around carrying that scripture, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you would like, I'm making sure in the back of my mind, making sure that I appropriate, I grab a hold of that scripture, not from the ideas of the flesh, but from the ideas of the spirit, from the word of God, from the presence of God. When I'm in the presence of God, I know that there is no condemnation because that's what it says, in Christ. That means in the presence of Christ. And like, you're going to go in the back of your mind, oh, I better stay. No, it's not about that. You can't work your way there. It's grace. It's gift. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So as we live our life today, now as a new people, we want to keep walking in the Spirit. Keep walking in the presence of God. Keep making decisions in the presence of God, in the Spirit. Asking God, seeking God, being with God, making God our, our heart and soul as we walk through our decisions every single day. And when we get it wrong, that's perfectly fine because we can remember that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can rest on that knowing that most of the time I am trying and as I mature, I am trying to listen to your spirit and your guidance and trying to walk where you ask me to walk, to do as you ask me to do, to restrain what you ask me to restrain. I'm trying to do that because you're asking and because the world you made is abundant, my needs will be met according to your Christ, your riches in Christ Jesus. And not only that, the world you made is beautiful to behold. And not only that, you walk with me and help me in the decisions that I make as I walk with you. So let me encourage you this year, walk with the Spirit in your decisions. Walk with God in your decisions. Walk with the Spirit even when you've done wrong, like, I, oh, I did wrong, but that's okay because listen to the voice of the Spirit that says, I knew you would. It's all right. I know you're trying to live with me. It's okay. I'm your father. I love you. Just because you've got something wrong doesn't mean I stop loving you. There's no condemn. You know, catch that scripture. Let's stand to our feet. And let's remember to worship the God who saved us, who now no longer has any condemnation for us. I reckon we should be a bit dancey. Let's do the first song. Let's not get all meditatey.
are so grateful. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the penny that drops. Father, thank you that there is no condemnation of those who are in you. And Father, thank you for your unconditional love that's based from your end, not our end. Help us to understand that. Holy Spirit, counsel us more. As Pastor Joe prayed today, that we will grow into it. Help us with our maturity. Help us to understand that your conditions are your conditions, not ours. Help us to stop and help you to grow in us. We give you glory. We give you honors. And we give you all the praise. And everybody say, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, Pastor. Don't forget next week, the big lunch, big autumn lunch next week. So make sure you bring along some food. I practice making focaccia this time around. So that's what I'm bringing next week. Looking forward to seeing you there. And Pastor Joe Wilton will be guest speaking next week. So that's going to be great fun. Yes, and lunch at the back there, fellowship with each other. There's some hospitality happening at the back. Amen. If you want prayers, there's a prayer team here. You can come up and have some prayers with the prayer team in here.